Welcome back to another episode of the Formula E Zone podcast, episode four, and today you are in for an absolute treat. First of all, we're going to be discussing the amazing Hong Kong e pre plenty to talk about. We're also going to have a discussion about who's in contention for the title. Plenty of names in the hat there. We'll also sprinkle in a little bit of news and a little bit of gossip and a brand new guest. This should be another thrilling episode of the Formula E Zone podcast. And once again, I'm going to be joined by Jack. Good evening, Jack. Hello. Thank you for having me back. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Good, good. How have you been over the past couple of weeks? Yeah, very well. Busy, but I think we all are these days. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, that's very true. The season's in full swing now, isn't it? And Tobias, he's decided to leave us today. He's off on his holidays, so uh, hope you have a nice holiday, Tobias. But instead, we've got a new guest, Chris. Welcome to the Formula E Zone podcast, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me on. So, just for the viewers, might not know who you are, let's just have a little bit of a, a mini sort of biography if you want. Who are you, Chris? Uh, well, I'm a, a Formula E journalist. I have been since the start of season two. I've been following the championship very closely. It was the first championship I properly reported on uh, after I left school. So, it's very much been my entire working life um since uh, since then uh, so i uh, report on it and i do a podcast about it as well i'm a big fan of the championship now i am sorry i didn't say i was going to do that i've just sort of sprung that on you so no, <laughs> i mean no, you'll fine. find out very yeah you'll find out very quickly that you know it's just <laughs> all very sporadic over here so I'd, I'd get used to that very quickly but today our focus is going to be on the hong kong e pre round five of season five of formula e the 50th ever race in the championship and first of all i want to start obviously with qualifying a few stories coming out of qualifying Stoffel van Dorn got his first ever pole position in the series and actually HWA's first ever points in the series as well. So that's sort of where I went to start. And Jack, I'll start with you. What was sort of the thing you took away from qualifying? Well, obviously, you have to remember it was a sort of a wettish to a dry session. So obviously Stoffel van Dorn was in group four, so should have had the best of the track. Um, and he took full advantage of it, which was great. Um, but yeah, for me... It was a real indication that HW, I think, are making steps forward because at the end of the day, yes, it was drying, but the track sort of didn't change too much from Group 3 to Group 4, so he still needed to like pull the, the lap out of the bag, in a sense, So which he did, which was brilliant and really good for HWA, so I think they're definitely making uh, good steps, and it was good for Stoffel van Dorn because he's, he's had a tough start to this uh, championship, and obviously life up from F1 wasn't great, and then coming into a tricky start in FE might not have been good for his morale and confidence, but he seems to have bounced back really well. And I think that would have done the world of good. I don't think the track what? changed all that much in all honesty, because you would look at Degrassi who was in group one and he still made it through to Super Bowl. And if you were to look at some of the other guys who went out in group three, group four, they weren't as quick as the HWAs. So I, I, I do think that there was inherent pace in those cars and, you know, the, the Venturi powered cars, especially because we saw three of them in Super Bowl. Yeah, I agree. I think they made, they made really good progress. And I think that shows the progress that they are making using the test days really well to sort of put their car, move it forward, uh, further forward up the grid, because, you know, at the beginning of the season, you could be quite worried for HWA, which we have to remember is a learning year because they're becoming Mercedes next season. So to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter, as I've said before, how they do this season. All they're doing is just gathering data, building up and sort of trying to progress their car ready for the big Mercedes factory team um, coming into next season. But they definitely are moving in the right direction. Well, at the opposite end of the grid, we had the big championship contenders, didn't we? We had Felix da Costa all the way at the back and the two Mahindras. Were you surprised at that, Chris, or did you really just put that down to the change? Well, I was going to say changing conditions, but was that more down to the wet weather? No, I, I think the, the Mahindra and the BMW really struggled in the wet conditions, yes. But I don't think that you can just put it down to the fact that the different qualifying groups had different track conditions. Cause as I said earlier, you know, they, it was fairly similar and we still saw quick guys up at the front of the field. Um, Nissan e dance being a, you know, another, another car that worked very well. Um, and I, I got to say, you know, even just watching them in, um, in shakedown throughout practice, the Mahindra and the BMW were the biggest handfuls. It looked like, um, on the track. So I would say that there does seem to be something with the way they set the car up or the way the car delivers its power that just doesn't work as well in the wet. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It might have been a setup thing because the race, 
the forecasts were predicting that it would potentially be a dry race. So I was going to maybe throw out there that maybe, you know, the way that Mahindra had set up their car going into race maybe didn't favour the wet conditions that they had in qualifying um, at that time. But yeah, they did look like a handful, as Chris said. So moving on then into the race, actually the two Mahindra cars tried to take it very steady early on. Some of the guys near the front, a little bit argy-bargy. I think Massa took a bit of damage early on, but it was early Roland once again making a pretty smart move into Turn 1, taking the lead early doors for Nissan. But the first real talking point of the race was that early red flag caused by Felipe Nasa and the two Mahindra cars. Nasa in the wet conditions, getting it, well, actually had a bit of damage, didn't he? Causing to smoke to come out the back of his car. Jack, how do you see that incident? Was it very straightforward in your eyes? Well, the incident was, I think Nasa should have stopped because he'd lost the front wing or the front wing was stuck underneath his tyres. Um, so he should have pulled over. I think the team should have told him to stop because basically he went into that right hander of turn three or two, t- turn two, sorry, and um, he couldn't stop. He just went straight on into the wall and then caused a roadblock. So really and truly, instead of trying to attempt that corner, Dragon should have been on the radio with the drivers D'Ambrosio and said that's what they should have done because he did just he couldn't turn. Poor guy, he, he could, couldn't do anything when he turned up to that corner apart from just plow straight into the wall. In his, and it caused the road roadblock. In Dragon's defence, they I think they had every right to try and get it back to the pits, repair it, because there was more than likely going to be safety cars in that race that was going to bring him back into play. And uh, with the, the pace of the race that we saw, then def, they, it would have been worth trying to keep Nasa in that race. I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing, yeah. Yes. Um, and you got to, you know, Nasa is pretty blameless in that incident itself. It's just a crying shame that when he did stick it in the wall, the two Mahindras were unable to avoid him. Well, and of course, they're both championship contenders, arguably, as well. So it was it was a big shame. And I think I, I agree with you, Jack. I think there definitely should have been a little bit more emphasis from the two Mahindra boys trying to get Nasa to come into the pits. But I understand what you're saying, Chris, as well. They, they were just trying to make the best out of the situation, I suppose. And all a bit of a mess, to be totally honest with you. Anyway, we saw that red flag and then things got back underway once again. And Ollie Rowland leading, Sam Bird nudged him a little bit in the rear and he sort of had an, I was going to say an issue, but it was a bit bizarre because as soon as they made contact, Rowland moved over the side. P- people were thinking, oh, that could be Rowland perhaps out of the race once again due to damage. But his car got going again. I don't, do either of you two know quite what happened there? Yeah, he accidentally hit the full course yellow button from the nudge. So he was suddenly stuck ah, at 50 okay. kilometers per hour and uh, not going anywhere, which, again, it's just more bad luck for Ollie Rowland, isn't it, really? Because I'm staggered how quickly he has brought up the pace to beat who I consider the Formula E king, Sebastian Buemi. Definitely. 100%. Because at the beginning of the season, you saw... Uh, Bawemi sort of was ahead and Roland has, has taken the fight to him like a rocket and you know in qualifying he's there he's p- making it like fastest in like group qualifying sessions now he's constantly up the, at the front and he's racing really well and it was just really unfortunate like it was weird it was a shame that he accidentally hit the full course yellow um, button because I thought straight away oh no he's had a technical issue because that's what it looked like it looked like he's just pulled over to the side yeah. a technical issue um, but obviously it was uh, he said after the race that he accidentally hit the full course yellow button. But at the time, but then obviously we must have, I think we realised during the race that he must have hit the full course yellow button because he didn't, he then continued. He wasn't like in last place with a technical, he was then running in temp. So he lost, he went all the way back down to temp after that, after that incident, which was a shame because again, he could have won that race. You know, very much like in Mexico when he was in a position to challenge for the lead of the race and it all went away with the energy um, consumption problems. This time, he could have won the race because he was in the lead of the race and he could have managed it because Hong Kong is not an easy place to overtake. Um, it's extremely tight. And he could have he could have won that race. There was the potential for him to do it because as we see, talk on it later into the podcast with the actual race that then unfolded, you saw how difficult it was to overtake. And the, the thing he had going for him as well, that Nissan Edams has got fantastic punch out of sl- low speed corners. So coming out of the turn one hairpin, turn six hairpin, he would have had fantastic defensive cover because of the twin motor package on that car. 
just gives it such great acceleration out the corner. And fair play to Oli. I mean, as you know, we were talking about him versus Boemi. He had next to no testing in that car yeah. before the start of the season because it wasn't supposed to be him driving it. He got a very last minute call up, did one day of testing in Valencia in the pouring rain, and then had to rock up in Adiria prepared for the season um and ha- apparently having to suddenly lose a bunch of weight for the for the championship as well so fair play to the guy i think he's done a fantastic job yeah that just underlines it for me what you just said it's just it's it's mind-boggling to think he's coming to a championship with next to no testing yes you could say you know he had that little tiny run in mahindra but it's a completely different car now so it's sort of irrelevant but the way he's just adapted to this to Gen 2 car and the series and obviously the drivers with the amount of experience that they have compared to him is just mind-boggling. So he's doing a fantastic job. And he could be, if that Nissan car can push forward even in maybe Season 6, if they can keep up, then I wouldn't rule him out for a title. Ooh, that's a statement. That is a statement. I'm guessing... That is... <laughs> that's bold early on in this podcast. But Wait, I, the way he's driving... Can yeah. you... Can you we we were talking last time about Verline possibly winning this championship because of the amazement of what he's done over his first couple of races. So the what Oli Rowland's doing to me is no different to what Verline's been doing. So if Verline can potentially win a championship, I suppose you could make an argument for any driver winning this this Formula E championship because <laughs> it's so nuts. But if you were trying to, you know, think about it realistically and trying to think about okay, who could actually mount a serious challenge? If you don't put Ollie Rowland in that in that bracket, then I I don't think you know you're doing something right. And for me, he has to be in it in some shape or form. I I don't really disagree with you. To be fully honest with you, he's starting to show a bit of consistency as well, isn't he? And I know this is a little bit off topic, but um, I am chuffed for him that he even got a chance in Formula E back in it was Formula Two, the very first season of Formula Two when he was up against Leclerc. I I was a bit of a fan of Ollie Rowland, and I hoped he'd get a chance in Formula One. Gutted he didn't. Then, when he had his race for Mahindra, I was thinking, oh, hopefully he could wiggle his way into Formula E somewhere. So, when it was announced he was going to replace Albon for this year, I thought, yes, this is this is going to be great for him. And after the first couple of races, it wasn't looking great, was it? But Nissan have really come into their own now, and arguably, like to Cheetah, should have probably had a win by now, definitely have a car to do so, and I expect them to do so by the end of the year, but I am chuffed that he's been able to carry through this form. But then, moving back onto the race, because I think we could talk about Nissan for quite a bit of time, but moving back to the race, Bird was leading, made a mistake, very uncharacteristic for Sam Bird, but those I suppose it was changing conditions in the race as the track was drying out a little bit more. Bird went wide and Andre Lotterer took the lead. Someone who in Formula E has had a, d- a difficult time, not necessarily being in the worst car on the grid, but he's been up against it in terms of his teammate world champion last season. And this year hasn't had the best of starts to the year. But now, I think you were just saying before the podcast, Jack, you were really impressed with him this particular race and I'll, I'll let you explain it a little bit more I don't want to take the words out of your mouth but how do you see him progressing him. well <laughs> well, how, <laughs> well that, that's someone else isn't it but how, yeah. how do you see him progressing for the rest of the season now well I think Andre Lotterer last season showed that you know he has you know he started off difficult as the commentators were saying back in last season he was basically disqualified from this race um what he was uh, because he had so many, did so many infractions, did so many things wrong, and he's really developed over season five, and he's carried that over into season six. And it was a really controlled performance. It was an Andre Lotter performance because you have to remember he's he's, he's thirty seven years old. He, we've seen him in so many different championships do what he's done in Formula E, where he's just controlled a race where he's just looks so you know entwined with the circuit and smooth and any all the all the great driving sort of credits that you want to give a driver we saw that from Andre and at the beginning of his Formula E career we didn't see that and he's really just come into his own and yet again another driver which if he's in the car that Czech teacher car to still to, for me is the fastest car on that Formula E grid but then for what if one reason or another they aren't showing it um, I think they proved that at the beginning of the season. I feel now the gap has definitely decreased their advantage from all the testing days that we've had. But again, you know, Lotterer has the chance, as I was saying with Roland, there's so many drivers you can make an argument that could go on to win a title. 
and Lotter, I think, is slowly, maybe not there yet, but slowly, definitely creeping more into that category. Maybe not there yet, but he's definitely moving forward, and he he, he will match or compete against anyone, which we saw today. Uh, well, not today, but you know, in the race. For for me, the mistake from Bird was probably one of the most key moments of the race because it cued a typical Andre Lotterer defensive drive. You know, in, in that moment, you've got one of Formerly's most robust defenders against one of Formerly's most notorious attackers. Um, and that is just a massive treat for everyone watching, really. Um, and seeing them nose to tail throughout the entire race uh, and massively pulling away from the rest of the field. I think they were quite lucky that Van Dorn was you know, able to back the pack up a little bit and it's so hard to overtake around that track. So uh, they there was a, a smaller bit of uh, luck in there because, uh, as as Jack said, there are so many guys who can win races. You know, I, realistically, there are six teams that are regularly capable of fighting for wins. And after the result we saw in Hong Kong, you have to up that to seven or eight even maybe. Yeah. So, you know, there are, that's that's your top 16 so it's like it's someone crazy. is going to come away so disappointed by the end of that. Yeah, it's just, that's that, that's the thing we said. Sixteen drivers could potentially win a race, considering the results that we've had so far this season. That's how close this championship is, and that's what we said sort of earlier in the beginning episodes. Whoever wins this season's championship is might not be the best or the quickest driver. It might be the most consistent driver. And, you know, that was probably Mahindra's big blow in this race because they'd been so consistent up until now. Right. And Consistent. Hong, Consistent. Hong Kong was their first race where they weren't. They were, they, they'd they had their bad luck, in a say. They had their misfortune. And all of a sudden, the championship's wide open. They've lost their lead and it, it's all switched. I don't think anyone's been too consistent. I think Jerome got really lucky in Mexico where he ended up fourth. I think. Otherwise, you know, he was looking at the the back end of the top ten. But this this result has very much put everyone in a position where no one's been consistent through the season. And yeah, definitely. Jev built his ship on being consistent, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the only one I'm seeing as being consistent is Mitch Evans, who somehow yeah, but... in a car, which I'm not too sure if you're considering that a race winning car, but I think he's only no. twenty points off the championship lead he's yeah. one of the only two drivers i think it is now to have scored points in every single race so like you say if one of the big boys was as consistent as evans has been this year then i think i think they'd walk it wouldn't they but no one has been consistent and lotterer someone who to be honest going into this year i thought was under a bit of pressure in a championship winning car i was thinking maybe he's a i know in formula e it's not quite a number one and number two driver quite like it is in formula one but i was thinking maybe they would potentially look at a younger replacement if needs be for the end of this year but i think well, well i was trying to elude for you to say this jack but you said before the podcast it was almost a coming of age race for andre lotter and i really did believe that and i i do agree with you with that statement he really did look like he was going to win this race and i was thinking in my head oh well that's brilliant for the story that we've got another different race winner from another different team. But then I hope you two will find me moving on to this, but then we saw the incident, the big incident, the race defining moment, Sam Bird, like you said, Chris, the most notorious attacker in formula E arguably making a mistake. I'll quit. I'll put that in quotation marks because do you, I want to know what you two think. Do you think this is a mistake on Bird's part or Lotterer's part? Because I mean, well, there's many different ways you can look at this, isn't there? You can either see it as a mistake from either of them, a race and incident. Did they deserve a penalty? Did they not? But let's start off first with whose fault do you think it was? And I'll start with you, Chris. I'll put you in the deep end first. The, you, the only thing you can accuse Andre of in that incident is uh, moving ever so slightly um, in the in the braking area in his defence, which is very heavily frowned upon in racing in general. Um, but he had done that consistently, and I think Bird should have expected that. Ultimately, it's it's Bird locking up, and Bird running into the back of a car that gave it a puncture. And I think the penalty, as on the cusp as that incident was, 
That is about as fine margin as you will see in motorsport, I think. But I think the penalty was justified. I, I, for me, I think, and I think for Marina, I think this has been the big talk that's come out of this race, is how much, you know, hitting and bumping into each other we've seen. Now, going back to your most consistent driver, Mitch Evans, okay, just to, just to give some context, just chanted John Eric Verne in Mexico. Did he receive a five-second penalty? Yes, John Eric Verne was not in a really great position, but no, Mitch Evans did not receive a penalty for that. So if we're going to talk the consistency battle, then it shouldn't have been a penalty because, you know, we've seen drivers be shunted off and not receive a, not receive a penalty. I think the fact that, you know, there was a puncher, it was for the lead of the race. I felt like the stewards had to do something. And, you know, at the, in in retrospect, I think it should have been a penalty because we can't have races decided by someone smashing into someone else on purpose or by accident, doesn't matter, okay, and causing that person to retire from the race, effectively, okay, and then that person wins the race. That's not right. That's why I, I agree with the penalty. But I think Formula E need to set more of a precedent. You, you can't have one week, someone shunting someone else and spinning, and that's not a penalty. But then someone causing a puncher, uh, and that's a penalty. So if you would look, to, if you take the two incidences away from their positions and put them side by side, there isn't really much between them. And one was a penalty, and one wasn't. So for me, I feel like the FI now need to, re- I need to clamp down on it because I think there are just too many cars going. I know it's easy in a street track to do, and these cars are pretty you know, wide, you could say. Um, and the street tracks are pretty narrow, and you have to expect that in Formula E. Maybe that's what the stewards and the FIA have been doing. Maybe they're like, we need to expect that cars are going to, if we want them to race close together, maybe we need to expect them the, the, to hit each other. The the issue that Formula E has got, so I 100% agree, the, the, the action involved stopped Lotterer from winning that race, and he probably should have done. Um, so... You you couldn't let Sam keep the win, um, but the issue that Formula E's got at the moment on a especially on a track like Hong Kong where it is just so difficult to overtake, the drivers do resort to getting their elbows out, bit of bumping and shoving, bit of British touring car style bumping to make an overtake happen. The problem you have as to compound that is that these races are getting quicker they're getting more and more flat out which is creating fewer opportunities for overtaking the hong kong race we saw was the shortest race in formula e history and that yeah. is just not creating strategy it's sef- it definitely didn't help that we had so many safety cars and so that just meant everyone was taking attack mode at the same time as well so there was no variety in strategy and it's they were barely even having to save energy as well so you have no strategy variation in that as well put those factors onto a circuit where it's nearly impossible to overtake you are going to have to get very creative to pull off an overtake and the stewards have just kind of let it be for the whole season I th- I th- they really do need to change a few things because if you start penalizing the consequences of incidents rather than the incidents themselves you're going to kill racing in this championship the the other thing they need to look at as well is the cars because when you bumped somebody in the gen one car it did not matter if your rear fender flew off it did not matter the fact that they had rear guards over the wheels as well we never saw these puncture situations with wheel-to-wheel contact we never saw people having to retire because of these incidents uh very rarely i mean people could keep going without their rear wings on the only reason they didn't was because the fia wouldn't let them (laughs) because they felt it was too dangerous (laughs) So the the fact that you've got the, a Gen 2 car, which is quite exposed to damage, we've seen it, but all you have to do is lose a small piece of that diffuser. You use a load of downforce with it as well, relatively in a Formula E car. But also it just destroys your aero efficiency as well. And that suddenly means you consume a lot more energy and it just takes you out of the race. The, the cars need to be less susceptible to damage. It, it's got to be less um, impact into your race if you want to maintain uh, a, a a breezier attitude to rubbings racing 
Uh, and so they've, they've got to decide one thing or the other. They've got to make some big decisions mm. about how they handle racing informally very quickly. I agree with what you say, and I want to I want to pick you up on what you said about you know formally needing to change something, and everyone going into the attack mode. I think that should be banned. Yes, yes, because it's rubbish. 100%. And I think this race really just pointed that out. When everyone goes into attack mode at the same time, what's the benefit of attack mode? Exactly. Because everyone's running at the same pace. It doesn't matter. We're just running a bit faster around the track now. I like, cannot believe there is no point of attack mode in in yeah. that situation. So maybe like in um formula one where they ban drs three laps after the safety car we should ban um attack mode for maybe two or three laps after the safety car has gone out because if everyone just goes oh we're going to arm attack mode because he's leaving because the safety car's going and then what's the, what's the attack mode ain't doing anything attack mode's been pointless in that race because everyone's just running around at the same um, incident, uh, same pace, sorry. Uh, but obviously, I think it was Frimes and there was another driver who didn't take the attack mode and were able to still defend their position. So that's how hard it was to overtake in Hong Kong, was that the drivers that didn't take attack mode at that time actually stayed in front. So you could say then, well, they benefited. But when 18, or uh, with 20 apologies, or probably a bit less, because but say the majority of the field at that time who weren't out, two drivers not to take it and that's, that's no there's no point of attack mode i can't believe they didn't foresee it and i can't believe they didn't change the rule immediately after the first race in adderia because this 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 is not the first time this has happened and i don't know why they're still allowed to do it yeah it's because it's just pointless it really is what do you think dan <laughs> sorry i was i was enjoying listening to you two then um no I, it's strange because i think this is the first real sort of problems we've seen with attack mode so far. I know in the first couple of races, it wasn't, I suppose, the effect they wanted it to have straight away. But then when we saw it in Santiago, I thought it worked really, really well. And Mexico, even though it was in a funny place, I thought it worked well there as well. So I'm going to be a little bit, I suppose, nicer to it than you two, because I think at circuits like this, where it is difficult to overtake, it's going to be difficult to use anyway but i also do agree with you too that it is it's just daft isn't it there's no there's no need for it to be done under the safety car because like you say if one driver does it then almost the whole field is like obliged to do it or else they're going to be at a massive disadvantage so yeah it should be changed and also i know we spoke in the last podcast about fan boost being a a waste of time really oh, i thought um, you were going to mention the fan boost sorry I I, get i've got to sorry podcast. Without I'm sorry. mentioning fan boost, and you've just ruined it. Well, I well, you two don't have to say anything, but I was. It's another one where all the drivers are pretty much out the race before they get to use it. So just, yeah, I, I think with a tap mode that does need to be looked at Good. for sure. And I will just go quickly back to the penalties because it was only a couple of races ago in Mexico where everyone was complaining that there were far too many penalties and it was far too complicated. So I think they need to find a middle ground a little bit because like you said, Jack, the Mitch Evans and Vern incident last time out, also many of the incidents in Santiago that just went completely under the radar was so much worse than Bird's incident today. And Bird didn't necessarily mean to do it. He locked up. And yes, I do think it was the fair penalty and a fair treatment. But I also find if he didn't get a puncher, I think he would have got away with it. So it's, I think there needs to be a little bit more consistency on the penalty side of things. So I think, uh, yeah, it, it, it needs to be looked at for sure. Um, I, sh- shall we move on then? Can to, I, can I add something oh, on, Chris. Mode real quick? Sorry to uh, disrupt That's the right. flow. But, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, like the attack mode in Mexico as well. They have been putting it in some... <sighs> some silly places they, they <laughs> yeah. are, they're so limited to the circuits they've already got i think what we'll end up seeing that new circuits will have attack mode integrated into the design hopefully because the last two tracks we've seen it in it's not been in a in a good place at all i i know i've i've been criticizing formally a lot on this show and i would hate anyone listening to me for the first time think that <laughs> i don't i don't utterly adore formula e if any criticism i make of it honestly comes um out of love um and it, it's because it's such a great thing that when you have issues like this it, it it stops it becoming in in my 
view perfection. Well, that's what that's what you know, I agree with you because I think it was also in terms of the attack mode because obviously we've been praising it as you said. It's some in some races it's worked really well, but in in this one it didn't work well. Just be, but it's minor things that the series, the championship needs to just look and just say, okay, that's not working. It's a new thing. Attack mode is a new concept. So I'm surprised. A bit like how Formula One, you know, got rid of that qualifying elimination um, thing. It's the same thing that they could have done with attack mode. They could have tweaked it and said, okay, right. So it's definitely not working on the safety car. Because if you just want scale electrics, as the critics call Formula E, then having everyone on the same attack mode at the same time is scale electrics. It's just everyone running on the same track. That's really hard to overtake. Um, and running at the same pace on the same line what? so you, they need to just take a look and go okay this is working that isn't working it's a whole new concept of racing for Formula E this season okay so there's always going to be teething problems and I think basically what we're seeing right now are the teething problems and like any baby like we're being as journalists right now reporting on it is crying and saying hey you need to fix this I don't like this and you need to you know put something in my mouth so I feel better Okay, and that's what Formula E need to do. They say, okay, okay, so what can we do to make this look better and, you know, make it much a better product? Because they're on the right lines. They're, they're doing the right things. Attack mode is actually a really good concept, but they need to realize when it's not working and stop the situations where it's not working, okay, so, like, under the safety car by banning it. So it can be used in its way that is intended to be used. I will say it's 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 going to be like you know DRS in Formula One the first few years you had to experiment with it, um, but yeah. I will I will also say what what is the point in uh, keeping the details you know how many times you can use it and how long you can use it for what is the point in keeping all that a secret to the teams until half an hour before the race when it's just the same every race yeah it's been it's been the same <laughs> this is true it made me laugh four minutes every, every race, race. Been, yeah it's unbelievable mix it up a bit. So as I said, teething problems, okay? We're yeah. just being spoiled babies right now, okay? <laughs> we're allowed. I'm sure we're allowed. But I like what you just said, Chris, about where it was placed because on these funny sort of mini straights they keep putting it on, the best one I think they've done so far this season was Marrakesh around that long sweeping left-hander where the drivers had to go offline. And I think at circuits like Mexico, perhaps if they did that through, I think it, you'd class that as turn one, just if you took the wide line, I think that just adds... A little bit more of a dynamic to it rather than it you know drivers having to brake really heavily go down a straight i mean in mexico where it was there wasn't really an opportunity for the driver behind to make the overtake it just ended up slowing the guys behind down so we'll call it teething problems jack that's yeah that's what we'll call it but i think uh and Chris, don't worry. I don't think anyone thinks you're fully hated on Formula E. It's just little pet okay. peeves, isn't it? And you always think like, oh, if they just change it slightly, it'd be so much better. But I think, yeah, it's it's fine for now. But I wonder if I'd love to know quickly. Sorry, we, <laughs> sorry, listeners, we're spending a while on this. But I wonder what you two think. Do you think they're hesitant to change it because it's Formula E's baby attack mode and it's their sort of new brand new thing do you think they're hesitant to change it because of that do you know, do you know what, uh, it was a quote from alejandro wasn't it he said what's the point in changing anything when you know it works so they they, they know that you know the two four minute activations we know that works so let's just keep it like that we we know where attack mode uh, zones work quite well but they're very limited on a second like in in mexico in hong kong there aren't corners like there are in Marrakesh or in Santiago where you can put it. The two places where it worked really, really well. So I think, you know, going back to what I said earlier about how they have to now start incorporating attack mode into circuit designs, um, which hopefully, cause apparently Hong Kong is getting a revised layout for next season anyway. So hopefully they're able to tweak that into the design. Yeah, I think uh, you're right in what I said, but I think it's really sort of silly really to say that it's working if it's not broken don't fix it we've had five races of attack mode how can you say it's not broken or it, it doesn't need fixing it's, it's like for me when i heard that i was just like how can you say that it's not even been tested really how can you call five races? yep it's perfect so for me i'm just like you know just take it as it comes because it was great first couple races so but you can't just say it's great because Problems will come with it, which we're starting to see. So saying that 
that it's great if there's no problem don't fix it is a bit silly i feel like you know just see how it goes this first season probably just keep it the same they probably will keep the same majority of the season and fingers crossed they go into the off season in for season six and go okay that you know go and analyze all the 13 races of attack mode and go okay what worked well what didn't work well and fingers crossed the safety car thing comes up as that did not work well okay and that gets changed for season six yeah, you do wonder as well why, like you both just said, you know, they, we don't find out how long they get to use it or how many times until a few hours or was it days or whatever. <laughs> there is a reason, because they don't well, want them to simulate. They don't want to simulate yeah. a race and finding out when is the best time to use attack mode. That is the purpose of that. No, yeah, but yeah. Why the don't they change time, it? Why, why don't we use different time, ones? If, 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 if uh, Sanya is four minutes of use and two activation times, then what's stopping me being my Formula E team going, okay, Rome's probably two activation times of four minutes. Let's try yeah. and see if we can bring that into a... What's stopping me from just making a prediction? Because that's what it's been. I'm and then lo and behold, lo, lo and behold, they probably are, because they're not silly, these teams. So lo and behold, I've made that prediction. I go to Rome because I've realised the first six races have been the same. And I go, great. We predicted it. We know exactly when we should use attack mode, barring a safety car. Shall we move on? <laughs> Shall we? <laughs> Shall... Sorry, everyone. We'll we'll get to the race result now because we're about there now. Um, another different winner. Another new winner. A first time winner in Formula E. Eduardo Mortara took his first win and Venturi's first win. A surprise result in the end, but mainly down to Bird's penalty. Venturi. We wanted to speak about them before the podcast, and I think it's a it's a great topic to look at because I remember on the very first podcast we were talking at how HWA, Neo, Venturi, oh, are they even going to get points this year? And yet, <laughs> round five, and they've won a race, and Mortara suddenly is in championship contention. So, Chris, I know we haven't really heard your thoughts about Venturi. Um, well... How how do you see this? I, I'm I'm staggered. Uh, I remember uh, preseason testing uh, where yeah, they didn't look very quick um, and they didn't look all that reliable. It must be said. Um, I, I remember the the final day they packed up early because both their cars uh, broke down during long runs with the same inverter issue. And we see during the beginning of the season the car wasn't reliable or fast. Um, all four Venturi powered cars, so the Venturi works team and the HWA customers, have all had mechanical issues during races. And that was still the same in Hong Kong, it must be said. Both HWAs had a drive shaft issue. Um, Pafetz luckily was during practice, but Van Dorns was in the race, that's why he retired. So for them to have turned it around to be not not just in a position where they can steal a good result, you know, because you you see Dragon and Neo in a huge race of attrition. They weren't in that same position. So Venturi really stepped it up in that regards, you know. Um, and, th you know, that's why Edo was able to get a fourth in Santiago and to steal a podium in Mexico as well. And why he's been able to steal this win as well. Redemption for his catastrophic error um, a year ago. Um, it is rather strange. They've used the test days fantastically and i'll be honest you know it's quite fortunate um that in this season we have three in-season test days which we've uh, used up now because before you were none usually i think it was only yeah, it was about one it was, it was, you had it was, one in punta del este i think we had one in like mexico one season and that was it yeah and in season three and season four it was only the the marrakesh rookie test as well you know yeah. no proper in-season testing so you, you've your 15 days private testing as a manufacturer and that was it um, but we've seen how crucial those in-season test days can be. Tajita turned their season around last year because of that Marrakesh rookie test. So you can see how it, you can go from a trough to a peak so quickly because of a, a good test day. Um, and Venturi have just been the huge benefactors of that. Yeah, and it's great to see because we were we were writing them off at the beginning of the year. We were like back market team, probably with Neo and Dragon. They're not going to be, you know, doing anything. 
you know, it was just going to be a tough season. The Venturi powertrain just didn't look very good. They were having, as you said, the drive shaft um, failures, and you sort of just wrote them off. But all of a sudden, they've just they've just sucker punched everybody, and they're now there. And you know, Eduardo Motar is just a couple points of the championship lead. Now, who would have said that after Saudi Arabia? That after five races, Saudi Eduardo Mortara is like two points off. It's crazy. So, and uh, you know, credit has to go down to the Venturi team and everyone Monaco for for doing what they've done and to get that car to where it is. And it's making progress. I'm not saying it's a race winning car. I don't think it's there yet. But I think it's better than the Jaguar car. And I think that's saying something. Well, and in the constructors' championship, they're ahead of BMW and to Cheetah. So, I mean, like you said, and I don't think the car is actually better than the BMW and the to Cheetah. But these past couple of races, and just for reference as well, Massa in fifth today, a really good job from Venturi. Um, I'll go through the rest of the result quickly. To Grassi in second again, very similar to last year, started off poorly, but he's starting to find a little bit of form now and. He's definitely in the title fight. I think we can all agree. Robin Frein's P3, a podium in the end for Virgin. I suppose they'll be happy with that, but the team coming on the radio to Sandbird partway through that race saying just take the second place and we look back at it now and think, oh, if only he'd have been able to hold on to second place. Daniel Apt in fourth. He continues his point scoring streak in every single race this year. He has scored points. Massa was fifth. Bird was sixth. Mitch Evans again scoring points in seventh. And Gary Paffert in eighth leads me nicely on to, I just wanted to quickly mention HWA finally scoring points today. Do we all think that's the worst car on the grid and I just wanted to quickly say as well do we think next year with Mercedes fully coming on board they're going to be able to fight um I'll start with you Chris again I'll throw you sorry I'm throwing you into the deep end a lot today but you're you're the newbie (laughs) I love it um yes 100% Mercedes are going to be in the fight um you you just know they were they they haven't taken a lackadaisical approach to this um whatsoever and having hwa in as a customer team a year before their entry is just going to be a huge huge benefit um to the i mean look at uh, how bmw tying in with andretti for two seasons has helped them out um they've really hit the ground running so um do i think the hwa is the worst car no i think i think the dragon is the worst car arguably the hwa is better than the neo car as well it's certainly shown a lot more potential you know van dorn's been in super bowl three times um because he's just got such immense speed but also you know we've seen the venturi powertrain has glimmers of speed the only reason that they've been outside of the points for so long is because they are a new team they're here to learn they're here to you know let formula e slap them about chops a little bit because that's just what Form Lee does to rookies. So coming in as a rookie team with rookie mechanics and rookie engineers and rookie drivers, they are all in for such a steep uh, learning curve. And it's, you know, it's far from over. It's, it just gets steeper and steeper. And yeah, I agree. I agree. They, 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 still have, they still have a way to go. Um, but yeah, I was going to say, is, is picking different. up on your point about the worst cars, I feel definitely of it because if you look at neo's drivers and turvey and and dylan they're good drivers and they've proven themselves in this series as really good drivers like dylan has come in and when he was at venturi you know he was on the pace straight away uh and turvey's been you know he could have won races he's been a consistent you know he had a consistent top 10 or super bowl appearance can't remember which one it was now um for ages um and they're at the back of the field and they they can't even as you said it was a race of attrition and where were they? Nowhere. And in a race of attrition, that's when the teams like that pick up points because that's where you want to be. And they're failing to do that. So for me, they're struggling. But HWA, yeah, definitely not the worst team. They've got the potential. But as I said before, it's just a learning year. It doesn't matter. As like Chris said, if they get kicked about, they, they learn all these little niggles that formerly throws them because it's just a learning year. It doesn't matter. All Mercedes wants is data. Finding out just testing the ground, so they are ready to hit the ground running come season six. And I reckon, now I think there was always this idea of a Porsche link between Dragon, but I feel like Mercedes coming into the season will probably be quicker than Porsche next season, for sure. That that Porsche type, that lasted, what, one race? And yeah. you, you do have to wonder about Porsche's you know entry, because uh, they, they've come into it uh, like, like Jaguar did, where they just come in uh, with their own motorsport team, 
um, having, you know, with no, with no prior Formula E knowledge, really. And their first season was very, very difficult indeed. So uh, I think uh, Porsche could be in for a tough one compared to, you know, Mercedes, for example. Well, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's going to be a difficult time for Porsche, isn't it? Um, and with Neil Yanni, is that how you pronounce his name? We'll, we'll pretend that's how you pronounce his name. Um, I think it's going to be a similar sort of year to HWA. But before we wrap this up, another team I just wanted to quickly mention, I'll just squeeze it in onto the end here, um, to Cheetah. Another really disappointing weekend. Vern was the last guy to actually finish. Lotterer, obviously, with his puncher, not able to finish the race in the dying laps, but massively missing out on a golden opportunity. Pardon the pun. Um, best car on the grid. <laughs> Surely they should be winning by now, Jack. I mean, come on. Well, I like that. But... um, it's just they're not hooking up. They're not hooking up. And you could have said they nearly did hook up with Lotter, but then that luck was taken away from it. So really and truly, they did, in terms of Lotterer's race, nothing really went badly. But Vern, as we were saying, I think, I think there's just this reigning champion bug where, you know, you win the championship and you're just set up to have a horrible season. We saw it with Degrassi, you know, Buemi faded away, Nelson Piquet, you know, the car was rubbish. In season two, it's like if you win the championship in Formula E, you just you're setting up for a horrible defense of it because that just seemed to be the correlation so far. Um, so for one reason or another, they just haven't hooked up qualifying, whether it being Vern not driving it properly or the car just not being set up properly. You know, it's just there's just things that they're missing, okay, which they weren't missing in season four that is costing because even Lotterer, like Lotterer, you know, he's great. He's probably been a bit more consistent than Vern in his qualifying um, positions, but it's still not great. They're still, you know, it's an old Super Bowl appearance, but then they're not really challenging for pole in those Super Bowls. You know, where has that pace gone? That's what I want to know. I, I would say Tuchita and Vern have had such incredible bad luck in the early part of the season. I mean, obviously, the both cars getting the drive-through, costing them a 1-2 in Adiria. Um, Vern... And Lotterer have to hold their hands up for their own errors in Marrakesh. And they did. Um, yeah. And in, in Santiago and Mexico City, they were unlucky with the track conditions where, you know, being out in group run really was a disadvantage. And being clattered in incidents that just had nothing to do with them. Vern has been uh, innocently uh, taken out of races three three times in, in the last two events. Uh, and... You can't you can't blame him for that. But in Hong Kong, I don't I don't really think he had too many places to hide. Um, because yeah. it, it, in qualifying, he was the only one to have a spin a crash the car. The reigning champion, somebody of Jean Eric Verne's caliber, you would not expect that. Uh, regardless of how tricky the conditions were, because nobody else seemed to be having all that many issues. I mean, we know some guys were slow, but none of them actually put it in the wall. And then from there, you're just in a toboggan because you can't make progress through the field for all the reasons we mentioned earlier um, in the show. Throw on top of the fact that he got a five second penalty for uh, colliding with Tom Dillman and then got a 10 second stop and go penalty for cutting that chicane and then not coming to a stop despite the fact that it was the team saying we want a harsher penalty for that, and yet none of the drivers seem to be abiding by that. But there are, there are so many issues, and he can't point the finger at too many places for this one. Uh, he really does need yeah, to I, I sit agree. back and think, no, okay, we are fast, I am fast, let's hook up a race. And we've, the effect of just being able to hook up a race and use your speed is incredible in Formula E. That's why we love it. Say yeah, do, every we, week. Uh, do we still think he can retain his title? Is that too far fetched of a statement? The thing is, I don't think I don't think he will. I, I don't. I, I don't think realistically. I, I think it's it's coming to an end for him. But we've seen so much inconsistency between the guys at the head of the field. Like, I mean, Verline's twenty four points down, and I still think he's got a, a shot at the title with the speed he's been showing. Because all, all, all you have to do is just hook up the next few races 
and that's it. You're suddenly going to be back in. Consistency is everything in this championship. And it's just something that so many people have lacked. Because this is the first season of a new generation of Formula E car. It's going to be like, you know, the first season of Formula E all over again. Um, with, with with incidents and, and learning the whole new car. And, you know, mistakes, penalties, that kind of stuff. That's going to define this championship. Whoever makes the least errors is going to end up winning this championship. Well, just before we go then, um, we didn't tell you about this either, Chris, but we like to do our little driver of the day at the end of every race and also an added catch, if you will. We can't pick the same one. Um, So, Jack, I'll let you pick first. I'll let you do the honours, although I do think it's quite difficult to pick a driver of the day this weekend. So who are you picking? I'm going to go for Andre Lotter. I'm going to take probably the uh, easy option. Um, from this one, because I think his race was faultless. I think, you know, he managed from the front fantastically. Yeah, he might have been a bit aggressive, but so what? It's Andre Lotterer, okay? Um, I thought he, I thought it was probably one of his better races in Formula E, and he, you know, you could say he deserved to win it. Um, you know, you could have made a case for him or Bird, but Bird made that mistake and Lotterer didn't. So maybe in that case, maybe Lotterer did deserve it a little bit more than Bird. So Lotterer. Chris, I'll let you go second. I'll, I'll go third this week. Uh, for me, Stoffel Van Dorn. He was sublime in qualifying and was holding up a really great race. And I just uh, I cannot wait to see what happens when he actually gets a break and gets gets a, a, a role going, you know, and the car doesn't let him down. And uh, there isn't some weird external circumstance that stops him scoring a good result which he's had in every single race so far yeah oh you've both left me in a difficult position here um (laughs) i will say felipe massa um damage early on uh i I wasn't going to say massa when we started this podcast but chris you mentioned i think you mentioned just before actually um that he had damage and they were able to fix it during the red flag and the fact that he's ended up fifth, I know Bird's penalty helped out, but I think this was a really solid drive from Massa today, and I think he needed that. Venturi scoring well, maybe not the the podium he's looking for at this point, but I think just that consistency is something that he needs to start putting in if he wants to have a successful Formula E career. But that's your lot for today's episode. We hope you thoroughly enjoyed the show. As always, if you've got any sort of comments, if you're watching on YouTube, you can throw them in the comments section below or feel free to tweet us over at Formula E Zone. You can also go and check out the website. I would highly recommend you do that for all the latest news in the world of Formula E. Always straight on the ball is Formula E Zone. Never misses a trick. But thank you for listening and we hope to see you next time after the Sanya E Prix.